Okay. So I just wanted to bring back this case uh, because we had some follow-up on this case. Um, so um, some of you probably remember this. Um, this was uh, given to me by uh, Art Stillman and um, just a, a case of a patient who came with chest pain, um, sudden onset, and um, had this, you know, really, you know, what looks like an exuberant, um, you know, at first glance, uh, you know, intramural hematoma within the aorta that um, is really extensive, goes along arch vessels, um, very, very thick in the ascending, descending aorta. Um, if you're uh, looking here at the left, uh, at the left main coronary, though, you start to see some atypical findings it seems to extend along the uh, left main and then if you go down to the abdomen um, I've shown before that it extended very infiltrated looking extending along the SMA um, look at the right renal there uh, left renal there and then as you go into the, uh, uh, the pelvis lower abdomen you see that it's there's essentially occlusion of the uh, iliac uh, arteries here um, very very large amount of mass effect and then the same day, this is from an outside CT, the same day um, we have a follow-up uh, CT um, showing this. So here's the follow-up CT. Um, look at the thickness of the um, hematoma there. Um, you can see that, sorry, I think I just muted myself. There we go. You can see that it's slightly decreased in thickness with the ascending descending aorta. You see that there's less involvement there of the left main, um, less involvement of the renal arteries right there. Um, and then going into the abdomen, now the iliac vessels are uh, patent. You can still see the uh, thickening or the hematoma there as well. So it would be atypical for an intramural hematoma alone to extend below the renals and to extend, um, you know, into the, the renals themselves in the left main coronary. Um, let me show you follow-up uh, several days later. Actually, I don't have that, but just let me cut to the chase. The patient's... Um, um, aorta was replaced, um, the ascending aorta was replaced, um, and uh, on path, um, it did show that there was some, uh, some hemorrhage into the wall, but uh, showed a, um, uh, findings that were consistent with the vasculitis, and in particular, um, Takayasu uh, vasculitis, arteritis. So uh, this presumably was, a, um, was such an atypical case because it was a vasculitis with superimposed uh, more acute hemorrhage into the wall, um, intramural hematoma. So um, these findings, we still don't quite know why um, it cleared so rapidly. Maybe it was the stress um, uh, hormone release uh, that sort of in, in some way rapidly uh, decreased <laughs> some vasculitic component of this process, or maybe it was the milking phenomenon that um, Howard su had suggested in the past. But um, just very interesting case. I mean, it's a it, number of findings that were atypical for intramural hematoma alone. And now uh, we have some path showing, you know, um, a vasculitis. So, um, you know, right. how, how old is this person? Um, I believe they were in their fifties, um, I believe, forties uh, or fifties. So, but I just thought that was, you know, we, very uh, interesting case of presumably a vasculitis that was complicated by acute hemorrhage. So. Um, let me show, here's another case here, different category, but um, you know, just a classic case with a couple different classic findings here. Um, this patient, I believe, was in the, uh, their 40s, and um, you can see already that there's some circumferential thickening of the trachea with some tracheal calcification, some narrowing of the lumen of trachea, and that's fairly extensive uh, there. Um, and then also you can see um, that in this relatively young patient, you have thickening of the um, costal cartilage and some um, calcification there of the costal cartilages. And you can see pretty exuberant calcification there for a pretty young patient. And this is a case of a classic case of polychondritis um, with tracheal involvement and with the thickening and, and calcification of the costal cartilage here. So I just thought that was a good combination of tracheal and, and uh, you know, and rib cartilage findings. So just the classic case there. And um, this is just a uh, quick case, just the cute case of um, a, let me show you this. Let me actually make sure I'm showing the screen. 
Okay. This is a case uh, where you can see some vascular uh, findings. Um, this large uh, vein here going posterior to the bronchus intermedius and then draining separately, pulmonary veins separately to the top of the uh, left atrium. So large, very large top pulmonary vein. And I just thought this was a key case because it's actually having some mass effect between the pulmonary artery, the right pulmonary artery and the top pulmonary vein on um, the right uh, bronchus there, so on the, the bronchus intermedius. So it's, it's uh, you know, large top pulmonary vein with mass effect on the, the bronchus intermediates there. So I just thought that was one of the larger top pulmonary veins that I've seen. So How there's that. The right upper lobe is that supplying? It, Brandon, also Let me, uh, the superior vein is smaller than usual. Yeah, the superior vein is smaller um, than usual right in here. Um, this one is certainly a large top pulmonary vein, and, and the question was how much of the, so we can see here that it's draining a, a pretty large portion of, you know, presumably the apical segment here, and then let me actually go to long windows to see that a little bit better. I think it may be picking up some of the posterior segment too right there, so it's picking up posterior segment, apical segment um, at least, and then draining into the top of the, the atrium. And then you can see the, uh, um, I think the uh, the smaller superior vein there is catching part of the um, uh, the anterior segment there, right in here. So, yeah, so it's, it's just kind of one of the larger ones I've seen. <laughs> All right, and then um, just a quick, quick case here, um, last case that I have is just a nice case. So let me bring up. There we go. And I think um, I think even uh, you know I think that David would agree here that this is a true crazy paving appearance <laughs> um, with ground glass and a lot of um, set. Um, lobular, you know, sepal thickening, interlobular sepal thickening, superimposed here, in a very uh, geographic um, ground glass and you know sepal thickening, crazy paving pattern that spares geographic areas of the lung. And, and this, of course, was um, a really nice case of alveolar prognosis um, with a, a nice crazy paving appearance with regional um, kind of geographic involvement. So I just thought that was a nice case of alveolar prognosis. Uh, Wow. That is one of the better ones I've ever seen, Brent. That is just spectacular. And there's no motion artifact either. It makes it even better. No, there's no motion. Right. The patient's not too dyspneic where they're breathing. Yeah. No, yeah. yeah. Why, why do we see the lobular sparing like this? Because I have a very similar case in my queue. You know, and you just see the secondary lobules that are spared and interspersed among others that are affected. I don't know. I mean, I, yeah, that's one of the things I wonder is why, you know, we all know that this gives you very, very stark uh, geographic pattern, but why is that the case? <laughs> I don't think anybody knows. So, <laughs> but anyway, that's, those are the cases I have this week. Very cool. Awesome. Thank you. Those are great. Thanks for the follow-up on that aortitis case. All righty. Uh, Seth, are you there? I see you there. Yes. Yeah, no, I finally got audio. Yep, I'm here. All right. You want to show some cases? Sure. Uh, so we'll start with, hopefully some of these came over. No, that one's not good. Okay, so here's a guy. Which one is this from? That's eh, not the one I wanted, but that's all right. So we were talking about Actually, we weren't talking about this. But anyways, here's a guy with this progressive diffuse lung disease, which is characterized by what may be called emphysematous spaces or cystic spaces. It's kind of hard to tell what you would call this kind of conglomerate areas of low attenuation. Um, he is a never smoker and has these other, you can see, diffuse abnormality, uh, ground glass opacity, um, architectural distortion, not a lot of bronchiectasis per se. So even though this is somewhat of a parenchymal destructive process, there's really not a ton of airway 
uh, enlargement from uh, traction bronchiectasis. Uh, and I will go to another study I think he has that might have, no, still doesn't have thin cut imaging. Uh, but the other finding you can see is this very enlarged pulmonary artery. And I'll show you again the lung findings. And uh, this is a couple cases we've seen out of here. I'll show you, a, I got another patient now who has subsequently went to transplant who has the same disease process. Um, also, you can see uh, pronounced pulmonary hypertension here with uh, what has been called chronic thromboembolic disease, although I wonder how much of this is from uh, intimal hyperplasia and uh, ather now, some of it is presumably chronic thromboembolic, but I always wonder with these people with very long-standing pulmonary hypertension, uh, how much of this is from, you know, basically the pulmonary arteries being subjected to long-standing uh, arterial pressures and basically undergoing atherosclerotic changes. And you can see, I, I would imagine that some of the case here with this kind of calcification and intimal thickening and uh, anyways, really bad pulmonary hypertension. His pulmonary pressures were like in the 120s and 130s. And again, the similar pattern of, let's see, the other one, he is not breathing. This guy was having shortness of breath. Anyway, so yeah, again, non-smoker, very similar pattern of this, what I think most people would call emphysema, and actually pathologically um, is emphysema, which is interesting because it's airspace enlargement, but it's not smoking related, and these other findings, which would be ground glass. And so- yeah, This is also, take a, also a non-smoker, this guy? Both non-smokers. Both young patients, non-smokers. So this is um, pulmonary hemosiderosis. So some form of chronic recurrent primary pulmonary hemorrhage. Um, and again, both of them severe, severe pulmonary hypertension. Uh, these areas of, again, chronic PE slash intimal hyperplasia from this, and then very similar appearing pulmonary disease in never smokers. And uh, these are young guys. These are guys in their 20s and 30s. So interesting pattern of disease. And we've seen a couple of these here now. So here's the other guy. Um, and I want to know if other people have seen this before or multiple times or have come across this pattern of lung disease. No? Okay. Two cases so, now. What? I've seen two, two cases, cases now. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, uh, I don't know what to make of it, but we have a couple of cases here. And what's interesting is the similarity of the lung findings. Um, this is a, just an incidental acute cardiac case. doesn't really mean anything. Uh, this is a person who has this, has a, I know there's some rotation here, but has an LAD that does come off or the left main that does come off the appropriate cusp here. And so here's this little LAD and it's very small, so it, it gives off the circ, and then after the circ, it's this tiny little branch. Let me reset the orientation. This guy has some other issues. But you can see it's tiny, tiny little LAD, and then he has this prominent septal branch that dives down and then supplies the remainder of the LAD. And so this is one of these classifications of a dual LAD, and if you look up, you know, initially it's like, oh, there's four kinds, and that's complicated enough but if you look at now there's multiple papers where now there's like people listing up to you know 14 different kinds of dual LADs uh, the clinical significance is not significant in this case there's a septal branch which is benign and this very small proximal branch but if you look up papers they describe every configuration the best I could categorize this I think was a, a type 7 or type 8 um, but it doesn't matter the classification it's just kind of an interesting dual LAD. And then this was a really interesting case that I had yesterday of a patient with these avidly enhancing subcutaneous nodules, um, thinking this was going to be a simple case of melanoma, and then has this very interesting parenchymal pattern. And uh, septal thickening, a lot of this peribronchiolar, I mean, to me, they're almost flamish shaped uh, lesions. Here's another one with maybe a little bit thinner cuts. 
oh, at this point, this person had gone on to develop a uh, fulminant, uh, not a fulminant, but develop a bad uh, pericarditis, which was strained and was just exudated. Let me go back to the other one. So does that, do these lung findings strike anyone as you would consider a diagnosis, just looking at the lungs? Because um, to me, they almost looked a little, I haven't seen many cases. Uh, they looked a little like uh, Kaposi's sarcoma with the septal thickening and kind of these almost flame-shaped appearance of some of these lesions. Would that would anyone else think that this could possibly be related to that, or does it look like nothing like that to people? I've seen a couple cases a long time ago, but I mean, it looks like something lymphatic. I was wondering if this is just a lymphatic carcinomatosis kind of thing. Yeah, so it is lymphatic. Um, and the interesting thing was that these nodules were biopsied, and these were all a very aggressive multiple myeloma, and these were all plasmacytomas. And so these were patient underwent, they were all throughout the body and underwent multiple biopsies and they were all um, anaplastic plasma cytomas. And that presumably the parenchymal involvement is just from the patient's very aggressive myeloma. Um, and again, we don't have, the patient unfortunately passed away. We don't have any confirmatory studies of what the parenchymal finding is, but I agree, Jeff, it is, it is likely just some form of myeloma involving the lungs, which is relatively uncommon. Um, but I, I don't know if anyone else has seen plasma cytomas look like that. Definitely not in my differential diagnosis. Right. You think what, about, what about bone? Were there, were there any bone findings that would go with plasma cytomas and bones look okay? No. So there was a big lesion uh, in the pelvis that was a bony lesion. Up here in the thoracic area, not much. I would probably pass it in most instances. And you know, like I said, they they biopsied um, multiple of these lesions in different areas at different points in time, and they kept coming back as this very high grade anaplastic uh, plasma cell myeloma. Wow. But, you think some of the yeah. septal thickening was just edema too? Because usually with the cases of capacies we've seen, it's I don't think of the septal thickening as being a big part of that. Well, it wasn't, it's not Kaposi's. It, um, yeah, no, I, you know, I, I was yeah, just, was, I was yeah. just wondering because the whole, the whole thing I got into a whole, because I was looking at this and I, honestly, I was wondering if this could be initially some sort of, um, you know, very aggressive lymphoma or some sort of HHV8 process with some sort of um, other involvement of the skin with some, with uh, plasma cytoma. And we, my red fellow and I were just talking about yeah. viruses and, HHV8 and its propensity to cause uh, lymphomas along, in addition to multicentric calcium disease and other things. And we were looking it up and seeing that, in fact, a lot of multiple myelomas, especially the very aggressive ones, also show um, uh, HHV8 um, genetic alterations associated with that. And we were just wondering, like, if anyone would ever look at this and think of in the lungs and the cacapaces. It's not. It's going to be just myeloma involvement. But... Um, Seth, was this, was this an HIV patient? Was this an HIV person? No, 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 not an HIV patient, but um, very, uh, no, but very immunocompromised. And I have to check to see. But you're what? right, it's some sort of infiltrative malignancy. You know, it's not yeah. just hematogenous metastases from, you know, a solid tumor. Yeah. What, what, was, what was the immune compromise? Do you know? Or I don't. I would have to look that up. Okay, not HIV. Yeah, I'll look it up. I'll send it. I'll send a more detailed history of her stuff. But she had a very interesting history. But, anyways, so those are uh, my cases. Thank you. All right, David, do you have any cases? Not queued up. Sorry, Travis. I know you're remote. Remote. Uh, do you have anything you can show, or I can go, or I can try. I will try and do uh, radiographs, especially. Yeah, where uh, your sound. where we can where I don't have to scroll through too much. Oh, your your connection seamless. Okay, Travis, That's where my, are you? Where I'm are in you? Sydney. I'm in Sydney. It's five twenty a.m. I'm gonna hop on a flight here in a few hours and come back. So this is one that I saw last week at the VA, and I, I sent this out to a couple of people, and this is pertinent to the discussion we were having a couple months ago now. 
and I had seen a radiograph. Actually, I had seen this radiograph, and you can see that you know, this patient has had a sternotomy. They have an AICD in place, and then they had these little, you know, coils or what looked like at first. And my first thought was this was just some old detached pacer line. And so my resident and I were just kind of talking about this. And I, the one thing that I, was, I thought was curious was it was just a little bit different course than the other one going into the subclavian vein. And that doesn't mean it's not going into the subclavian vein, but we had some time. It was slow at the VA. So we went back and we're digging around. And you can see that these were two days or these were one day apart back in 2006, 526 and 527. And he between these two studies, obviously there was no change in his sternotomy wire, so he didn't have a surgery, and he'd already had a bypass graft, and that's when I began to be suspicious that these were actually the endovascular coils, and so that got us digging in the chart. I told him, look at the, you know, look in the medical record on that date and see if he had a cath or some sort of embolization, because I was starting to get suspicious, and sure enough, my suspicions were confirmed that these these coils are in the lateral costal artery right here. And this is a patient that had had a Lima bypass graft and was still having chest pain. And so they went in and they uh, embolized this as they thought it was causing collateral steel phenomenon. And you can still, he still see he still has a patent lateral costal artery on the right. So often when we do see these, they're they're bilateral. And this is the first case I've seen. I've, I've been told you know, that this was the complication or the only real clinical relevance that these ever have is if they cause steel phenomenon in a patient with a bypass graft. Since of course this arises from the lima and would be a, you know, potentially a, a, you know, a preferential pathway of blood flow instead of into the lima. So, so this was intentional uh, embolization of this. This wasn't something that migrated. This is what they were aiming no. for. That is, that's what they were aiming for. And the idea is in these patients that have had bypass grafts, that if it's still a collateral that communicates that it can cause steel phenomenon and result in ischemia in patients that have had prior Lima bypass. Wow. So, yeah. So, but Jeff was the one that kind of started this discussion a couple months ago and, and, and I just happened to see this. So it always benefits to go back and look at the oldest studies patients have. You never know what you're gonna find. The, um, this one is a, a cute radiograph really quick. I have to find the one that is, that is relevant. So this is one that, that Brett Elliker showed me when he was on a couple weekends ago. And this is a patient that I think she's had a, I, think, I can't remember if she's had a pancreatectomy and has chronic feeding issues or something, but she has this, some sort of gastrojejunostomy tube here, and then on her radiograph a couple days later, she had been having some emesis in between here, and it was actually a pretty good pickup that Brett noticed this, and looked like it could be a tube, and then he looked and he saw that it was actually in the abdomen, as you see here, and it was traveling retrograde. Now we do some of these edge enhanced images where you can probably see it a little bit better, but it was just that her G tube or her GJ tube had inverted and traveled retrograde up her esophagus. And so obviously an important finding if they're gonna try and consider feeding her through this. So it's probably her retching that contributed to the retrograde migration of this, but just a cute, uh, a cute case of that. Just a reminder, you know, things that we can look for on daily portable radiographs. Now I had one here, I was gonna show this case of alveolar proteinosis and it's very similar to the one that Brent showed and it's a very pretty case of crazy paving. And it's just amazing, the, you know, these are like secondary pulmonary lobules that are either completely involved or completely spared. And one of the reasons I wanted to show this, I've had this in my queue a while, uh, was just regarding the diagnosis because in this case, you know, they did the diagnosis based on the presence of anti-GM CSF antibodies in the BAL. So I guess that's a that is a marker, you know, that our pulmonologists at least consider to be, you know, almost 100% specific for the diagnosis. 
And it's in, what's interesting, she had had reduced exercise tolerance forever. Um, but yeah, this was their, that from their note, the positive GM CSF antibody. So I don't know, do you guys, do your pulmonologists talk about this as a diagnostic criterion? Um, we usually use no. the old passion white, you know, the, 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 the actually getting that debris. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and it was, it was cause the bronc was done somewhere else and uh, all the, you know, yeah, if you have that milky, cloudy junk, but this was, you know, this was just based on studies that were done from that fluid. Um, yeah, because they didn't have the information on whether the BAL fluid had the typical appearance, but she's still slated to come back and get a whole lung, get her whole lung lavages, but they were, you know, they treat that as like a, a pretty specific marker. I think it's like or, uh, 90, prognosis. 95 percent of them have the autoantibody and the other five percent are secondary. But I showed that case, yeah. I guess it was a couple of years ago of a patient who didn't respond to lavage and got they gave the patient GMCSF and it went away. Kind of right. And that's the that's the other question. Right. It's because it's confusing because I got confused, too, because I thought they used GMCSF as a treatment, which they do. But this is an anti GMCSF antibody. Yeah. So. So, but th doesn't that make sense, Travis? I mean, the reason yeah. that the reason you treat it with GMCSF is to overcome the uh, antibody blockade. So you just you just overwhelm that antibody that's glomming onto the native GMCSF. Right, uh, you're right. No, it it does make sense when you think about it. I was just getting yeah, I was getting confused at first when I was trying to tease out you know think of the right. difference between the antibody and actually treating with GMCSF. No, you that's a good point. Um, let's see, I had a couple of others, but, oh, I, oh, this one. So this is actually, this is another good radiograph case. And so this is the patient's radiograph from July 31st. And this is, let's see if I can unsync these. No. And here's her follow-up radiograph when she came into the hospital again. And this was several days later. She's neutropenic at this point. You can see she has a port catheter. Curious if anybody wants to uh, put their money on where the uh, finding is. Right, right lower lobe. Lobe. Right lower lobe. Yeah. Right base. Yeah, it was. It, more, right, I was wondering if it was going to be nodule, right middle lobe. Hmm? Is there a nodule more laterally? I think that's just your yeah. nipple down here. But oh, what's interesting on this case is that yeah. So my resident saw this as and and thought this was a nodule on the left, but of course she's had a mastectomy. And so this is actually just her nipple, you know, that's been, that was left or reconstructed. But this was kind of interesting here, just because I thought it was going to be right middle lobe, because you kind of lost the right heart border. And then I, but I didn't really see much on the lateral view. It's pretty subtle, but I think, yeah, it's right lower lobe here. Um, but this was one, and this was when I raised the question last week about, you know, the role of biopsy in the diagnosis of angioinvasive fungal infections. But this was this patient's CT, and you can see this was a couple days later, and they have this peripheral area of consolidation. And she was neutropenic. Her neutrophil count was zero. She wasn't responding to any of the uh, typical antifungals or the, the high-dose antifungals. So we did a CT guided biopsy of this, and we core these. And it never did grow anything, but they did find fungal elements in the surgical pathology and it was an angioinvasive, and they thought most likely mucor. And unfortunately, she ended up she ended up passing away. And it wasn't even from this; she ended up with some horrible GI bleed. But um, I thought it was just a nice, subtle radiograph, and just a reminder: like we're pretty, you know, quick to pull a trigger on on further imaging if they suspect anything. There's her reconstructed nipple on that side in the asymmetry. Can we uh, can you give us a long window here and see if we have birds nest birds nesting in our presumed zygomite? Yeah. Maybe a maybe a tiny bit of bird's nest in here. All right. yeah. Hey Travis, so, can you put the two laterals up next to each other? Because the frontal finding is challenging, but I'm curious if it's super fine. It's super subtle, yeah. And even the lateral is super subtle. Which makes you think this thing evolved rather quickly. Yeah. Which goes along with mucor. Which yeah. You wonder if it's just like right here, just smaller. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I I actually thought I thought it was I was it was one of those ones where you're better to be lucky than good because I thought there was something going on. I didn't like the right heart border, but I think I can't even really explain that. 
But uh, Travis, there's yeah. eight days between between the radiograph and the CT scan. I think that this lesion that you showed us on CT is farther posterior to the consolidation that you showed on lateral view on the 12th. So it should be sitting right back against the yeah. You're right. Wall. So I, I think, think yeah, eight, I don't eight, know. Eight days is plenty of time for mucor to develop from imperceptible to big mass. Yeah. Like I think that fits with uh, zygomycete too, rather than aspergillus. Well, okay. So yeah, I I agree with that. But yeah, okay. So probably the radiograph is just normal then, because well, I was just trying or, to or yeah, showing or, something else. Yeah, showing something else. Yeah, subtle. So all right. Well, Jeff, those are mine. All right. Well, thanks, David. Do you have any queued up yet? No, sir. All right, no worries. All right, I'll show a few, and um, let's see what I've got here. Uh, this is an interesting case Chris Francois brought to my attention. Uh, let's see what we got here. Launch it. All right, yes, I agree. All right, so this is um, an incidental finding here uh, from this outside scan, but notice that the coronary sinus was quite large. And you see this large cardiac vein coming into it. But uh, when Chris and I were looking at this, we noticed there was not a connection to the, you know, the right atrium on this view. And then you can follow this vein up. It's quite large, a great cardiac vein. And then it kind of makes a medial turn. And then we also notice this small vessel running lateral to the aortic arch, looking at the brachial valve vein. So it looks like there's a, a tiny little left SVC um, and then this large coronary sinus. So um, if you look on the coronals, the question was, was there an unroofed coronary sinus, but the, none of the right heart chambers were, or none of the heart chambers were abnormal as far as a shunt goes. And it appears that this just sits right underneath and doesn't actually communicate. So we were thinking this is just an, a weird drainage pattern. I've no, I don't know. I haven't seen this. And I think we have some delay of the abdomen that, you know, see this, there you go. You can see that's filling with denser contrast up here, that's as far up as it goes. And it doesn't have the same attenuation as the, as the right atrium. So it looks like the coronary sinus drains probably cephalat into this left, this little tiny left SVC um, coming up here. It's just interesting that it's not as big as I would think. Jeff, I showed one like this a couple years ago with the very small S left SVC and it was the same thing. And I think this is a form of osteoatresia of the coronary sinus. You know, it's never really been described like you're showing here, but that it fits the description. Right. And you're right, it drains retrograde. And of course you wouldn't want to ligate it or those patients can end up with, with venous myocardial infarctions. Right. It's just, I was just surprised, I was surprised how small it is, but I guess, yeah. I guess this coronary sinus acts as sort of a reservoir so that the, the left SVC doesn't have to be so big. Yeah. I've, I've, always wanted to like go through and find all the cases of like smallest left SVCs like this. Cause I think it's a marker of, of this finding. I haven't been able to prove it, but I'll have to start looking for it. All so right. You're saying osteal hypoplasia of what Travis? Osteal atresia of the coronary sinus that's been described. And it's so it, instead of the coronary sinus draining into the right atrium, or the right side of the heart, it, it does, like Jeff is saying, drains north and decompresses into the left subclavian or, or brachiocephalic vein. Yeah. Yeah, so you see the, you see the anterior interventricular vein and the other cardiac veins coming in to this deep vein. And these are thicker cuts, but you can see this vein kind of hiding in there and then it gets into this big tortuous vessel and dumps into here. And then you've got the route north to the SEC. I'm gonna have to start looking for that. That's interesting. Okay, um, this is kind of an interesting case. This is a patient who presented with a, looks like a, a lung mass. They have some cavitation in it, and then there's a little bit of fullness in the mediastinum. Younger patients, so, you know, you wonder about an infection, not a primary lung cancer. Let's see if I can make this scroll. And this is the outside CT, and we see there's this soft tissue mass, and I'll show lung, in the anterior mediastinum, sort of along the uh, aorta but then it extends out into the lungs and you've got this area of consolidation with cavitation and you know, a little bit of small nodules. So the question is, is this an infection or, or what? And uh, this had persisted despite antibiotics. So 
uh, this this part of the mass was cored, and this is all Hodgkin lymphoma with pulmonary involvement and no infection whatsoever. And I was, I guess, a little surprised. I mean, the, the mediastinal mass doesn't surprise me, but to see this sort of cavitary consolidation with small nodules was a little unusual. Here's the soft, the thinner cuts here. You can see the this infiltrating soft tissue in the meat's time. That looks like, I'd buy that for lymphoma and a heartbeat. I guess it just extended into the lungs and then, and maybe the, the necrosis led to the endobronchial spread of, um, of just either necrotic tissue or whatever, but you know, all lymphoma and here's the, the continuity there. So don't see Hodgkin directly. And I mean, it does do it. It's been described often directly from lymph node and uh, direct lymph node extension, but not see present with a large mass like that. And what, any comments or anybody else seen something like this? <clears throat> lymphoma can look like um, pneumonia, which is what this does. Right. And lymphoma can cavitate. Uh, there's a classic article from 1978 by um, Godwin, that's the guy, um, <laughs> talking about cavitary, cavitary um, lung nodules and stuff like that, and lymphoma is one of them. Okay. Yeah, because most of them, like the, the pulmonary lymphomas we see, the maltomas are, look like organizing pneumonia. You've got a mass like air consolidation, but they preserve the airways and they're nice and homogeneous and kind of soft. Right. This thing looks angry. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, all right. Another pretty classic case, but nice radiograph. So this is a uh, younger patient who is originally from... West We're not seeing it, Jeff. What? Why We're are not we? seeing it. Because I haven't shown it yet. <laughs> okay. I'm picking the correct radiograph. So this is yeah, I'll, this is a patient who came from uh, West Africa and had a cough and some fever and stuff. And you can see we've got pretty classic appearance of a large cavity with debris, lots of nodules. Chris Meyer likes to call this an upstairs, downstairs lesion. So you always want to think about TB. So this is MTB, post-primary. And so this is the radiograph from three months later. I'll see if it's going to show both. I don't know if you're, let's see, there we go. And you can see it gets better. It takes its time, but it, it can get better with antimicrobacterial treatment there. So most of the TB I do see ends up being in, in patients from abroad. We don't have a large TB population here, but just pretty straightforward one. This is kind of a cool case because we don't often see it. Uh, sarcoid in this way. So let me uh, let me pull it up and then start at the beginning. Right, so we want to start with the older chest radiograph. Find it. Yeah. So this was the initial presentation. So a classic sort of you know one two three or whatever you want to call it mediastinal hyolymphadenopathy. The subaortic nodes are big as well, and there's really not much in the way of the lungs. And then uh, so that was back. Um, when was that? That was in 2016. And there should be, here's the corresponding CT scan. And we see the big nodes, nice potato nodes, or whatever you want to call them. A few nodules out in the lung, but really not much in the way of lung disease. And about, not quite a year later, but close to a year later, this is the subsequent radiograph. And you'll see that the lymphadenopathy got better, but now we see these micronodules in the lungs. And then I have a corresponding CT for that, which is here. And what we see is all of these perilymphatic nodules very well defined. The lymph nodes are better, sort of in a classic location. So this is, even though it looks better, this is actually sort of progression of sarcoid. If we, with the old uh, radiographic staging, we would have gone from a stage one to a stage three. Um, back at this time, the, back in Oct uh, the previous year, the this was an outside study. There wasn't a diagnosis of sarcoid. It was a rule-out lymphoma sent for a referral for potential bronch. And so they got the follow-up imaging uh, just by the time the patient was referred and everything to our institution. And we found that it actually had progressed, even though the lymph nodes got better. So it's, uh, it's a true, actually a progression of sarcoid. So it should hopefully still respond to steroids. But I yeah. So, uh, were, was there on the first one we were noticing there was a lot. It seemed like there was um, at least some mosaic attenuation. Um, of, the, we, of the CT. 
on ECT, um, yeah. you know, we've noticed a lot of our patients have some uh, either obstructive or mixed PFDs uh, because of the, you know, either the compression due to adenopathy or the airway involvement of sarcoid, you know, and here yeah. there's such... Good point. Yeah, I, my, my hunch with this one, yeah, it's, there's a little bit of air trapping, presumably. It's... Um, it's hard to say what it is because clearly there's a lot of, you know, there's some pretty chunky nodes here. So it may be, it may be part related to that. And there are some nodules. So there probably was some airway involvement. The other thing is though, with the, I've also noticed some really large patients, we tend to just see some air trapping anyway, but that's a good observation. I don't know. We, we didn't have. Air oh yeah. And it, we're noticing on the uh, radiograph as well, the, and, and also on the CT, the bronchial walls are really, really thick. And I wonder if that's just, um, you know, uh, bronchial involvement, um, yeah. you know, so on this radar, it's hard to say it's a very noisy image, you know, very large patient. Uh, this is the more recent radiograph here. Oh, hold on. There's the PA and there the airways look pretty crisp. So, so yeah, I, I just haven't seen a lot of sarcoid go that way without, usually we make the diagnosis up at the first stage and then, you know, they're, they're treated and they either stay the same or get better. It's unusual to see the lymphadenopathy just melt away and then, the lung nodules develop. All right, and then this is a pretty just classic case, but it's a it's a sizable one. This one uh, was resected last week. And let me pull up the image as soon as we launch. Okay, let's try. It. There we go. And you should be seeing a radiograph. So this patient, you can see, has some scarring. An older patient has this large mass, well circumscribed inferior and medial margin, kind of fades off. So a good example of a an incomplete border side. And here it looks. Looks like it's probably extra pulmonary or it's loculated pleural fluid or something. And on the CT, we see this is a big uh, solid mass, very high attenuation, a lot of heter internal heterogeneity, whether that's calcium or vessels, I'm not sure. And then there's a little bit of pleural thickening next to it. But uh, this was suspected to be a solitary fibrous tumor and indeed it was. It's just one of the, it's a larger one, not as big as that one Seth showed us a while ago. It was the size of a volleyball, but, um, and you can see a few, uh, I think a few of the intercostals may be feeding this as well. You see a couple of them kind of going into it. So, mm. I, unfortunately, they didn't take a picture of it when they took it out, but this one didn't come out through mm. a vast. They had to do a thoracotomy to get this one out. It's pretty big and take a piece of the lung to go with it. Because sometimes, even though they arise on a pedicle, you can see this patient was a smoker, bad emphysema. So, there was probably more adhesions and it was just more challenging to get out. But. Solitary fibrous tumor, as far as I know, did not have symptomatic hypoglycemia, which I've still yet to see, even though the literature says it should occur in about a percent. Yeah, I was just going to ask that question, too. Has anybody actually seen that? No. Or is this, um, is this some myth that's perpetuated from, like, one case report? Well, if Dave <laughs> hasn't seen it in ever however many years he's been out doing this, I, it probably doesn't exist. Yeah. So, so what percentage, Jeff, did you say the literature says? What I've seen written in textbooks and quoted is 8%, which means if you've seen 12 of these, you should see one. And I've probably seen three times that number. Right. I think between all of us, yeah, we've probably shown 25. Yeah, we've probably seen 100 cumulatively amongst us, if not. Yeah. Great, it's great, great theory. You know, I wonder if it was a different tumor, and now that we've gotten better at immunocytochemistries, I mean, these are pretty much, uh, you know, they CD34 positive, and there are other findings that are pretty specific. And, you know, the fact that these used to be called benign mesotheliomas, which they're neither necessarily benign nor mesothelial, that you know, maybe what was called an SFT back then really wasn't. It was something else. The one that caused glycemia, maybe it was, a, I don't know, some kind of neuroendocrine tumor or something. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what I've got. Jeff, I can show one more case and I can show a quick uh, paper that I pulled up on the osteoletresia, the coronary sinus. Cool. This is, this is an old paper I had pulled up before. It's just a case report from Annals of Thoracic Surgery, but um, just the intro nicely just kind of outlines the, the importance of this. These patients, the left SVC is the outflow channel of the coronary sinus. And of course, it doesn't really have much you know, importance unless they're going to divide the, the left SVC, in which case, you know, as it says here, it may lead to myocardial edema, ischemia, necrosis from venous obstruction. Now, I couldn't find a good case of the CT, at least back when I'd searched, but this was the, um, 
this was just the angiogram they had done, which or venogram, which shows, you know, it's this was in a, a child, I think. So it's still smaller than the the right SVC. It's not quite as small as yours, but it does look kind of similar. How you have the larger coronary sinus, and then you have, you know, as how it gets smaller as it goes up. But yeah, I keep people should keep an eye out for it. I think it's an interesting anomaly, and oftentimes the couple of cases I've seen, I've just noticed that small SVC first. And none of the cases, unfortunately, I've, have I ever had gated to really confirm, you know, but even though they look like Jeff's case where there doesn't look like there's a communication, even if there's a little motion. All right, and then I want to show one case and, um, you know, and, and I'm going to show this just to illustrate the, what we see as the value of expiratory imaging. And this is a patient that's path proven. I, this is because I've, using the CTP now to anonymize these. This is actually a fairly recent case within the last couple of years. It's not 2003. But I think that, uh, does anybody disagree that they would say this looks like a possible UIP pattern based on the inspiratory imaging alone, you know, based on the distribution? We don't see any honeycombing in this case. It's definitely looks like it's basal or peripheral reticulation traction. It's got and, some... Um, and some uh, some um, some bone formation in there too. So you have yeah some... a little yeah a little dendroform ossification. Right. Some of those it, yeah. It's it, it looks like there's a little more central involvement though. You wonder about chronic HP in this case. Yeah, and and there is a little bit of central involvement. You know, on based on this alone, I, I would say you know it'd still be one of those ones where we would probably be where we would be in the in the possible, but it's obviously a leading question. I'm going to show you the follow-up we had. Now, this was after a biopsy when the patient came in, and here too, yeah, there's you know there's some central bronchiectasis and airway dilation, and maybe you can argue, you know, faint ground glass. But I still think that you know this looks like it's going to be UIP. You know, that this is wouldn't be surprised if it was IPF on biopsy, except that we had expiratory on this one, and we do dynamic expiratory which I kind of like, where we just, the patients forcefully exhale at, at three different levels. And that brings out the air trapping in several different lobes here. And yeah, and Brent, you're right, that was a, a clue, but the, the air trapping, you know, it confirmed. And the biopsy actually showed granulomas, several granulomas, which they thought was, you know, consistent with chronic HP. So kind of illustrates the, I think, the benefit of the expiratory imaging. Obviously, it's a pretty case. So yeah, and we We're just see a lot of chronic HP. Basically, if it's a woman patient these days, um, you know, I really doubt the diagnosis of IPF, um, and it's it you know quite often turns out to be chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, and you don't have to have granulomas when it gets to this stage of fibrosis like that. The granulomas can be gone, right? And, but the fibrosis, you know, is forever. And and we do have some of those cases that we debate where it looks like HP with air trapping and then they don't see the granulomas on path and then there's always the argument people want to call it, you know, UIP, IPF. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I just thought bring it back into some of the routine stuff that we see. This was one of a particularly good example from recently. Okay. Um so F is a patient who is about sixty years old. Uh, she was transferred from a different hospital with fever, cough, and hemoptysis. And they were concerned this was going to be probably tuberculosis. And on the third of the month, uh, she presented with um, a very thick wall cavity lesions in both upper lobes. Um, and then the patient did have a CT scan uh, performed. Um, and then we do see very uh, thick wall cavity lesions in both upper lobes. And patient then did get a bronchoscopy, which so far has been negative for uh, fungal infection and tuberculosis. But interestingly, the only thing that came positive um, in the history was an ID fellow who took that patient when uh, to Florida to a lot of hookah bars and was using the wet tobacco and it grew alpha hemolytic strep in the sputum. So, and then I have a follow-up a month later 
they did improve with uh, treatment with antibiotics. So my interest is, have anybody seen uh, things related to hookah smoking like this and alpha hemolytic strep? <laughs> Wow. Wow. Yeah, this, yeah. Uh, we've, I think we've seen a couple of cases of hookah lung, or different injuries related to hookahs and things. That's interesting. Yeah, I showed yeah. one that had just small central ovular nodules, but nothing like this. Yeah, so that's probably, I think, still see the connection between uh, her going there and the treatment with antibiotics and all the TB and fungal, everything uh, negative. Um, and how maybe in six months she may get better. So then I have one other uh, interesting case. Um, uh, this, one second. Um, I will show you. It started as I said, lung screening uh, program. And this was from the lung screening, which is a very low dose. And I think Dr. Thompson may be watching this. So basically, uh, a 60 year old person uh, during lung screen, uh, there's a lot of emphysematous changes. And it was felt there is some mass like deformity uh, in the uh, posterior to the uh, trachea. So and that's why a patient then went on to get a um, CT scan with contrast. And their interesting finding shows up on the CT scan. So she did well for so many years. So the left pulmonary artery coming as a pulmonary sling, which showed up as a pseudomass on the lung screening. Um, and I think I may be able to get you the corona. And yeah, the, and one of the residents did the uh, video of the. And this is the. We have, we have complete, complete track, trickle rings there. It looked as if. Yeah. Right. Was there so the, branching of the airways as well, or is it just compressed? Uh, no, just um, uh, airways are okay. Okay. So it was just the sling. That's so, really a nice case. That's great. Yeah. It's, it, well, yeah. it's interesting how asymmetric the emphysema is. You've got all that cystic stuff on the left and minimal on the right. Usually you think the other way around from smoking. <laughs> I wonder if that yeah. there's some like low grade, whether it's developmental or some kind of injury, or maybe, maybe the sling kept the smoke on the left and wouldn't let it out. <laughs> It could be. So far, uh, they're going to manage the patient conservatively is what the chart says. They're not going to treat the sling at this time. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for sharing those. Were, that's a great case. Yeah. One last case. Let's see if uh, this is a six-year-old uh, with a right paratracheal mass. Um, and I will show you the CT um, uh, findings lot of uh, um, calcified lymph nodes and um, so what is uh, and there's some granulomas probably scattered tiny granulomas and uh, so patient did go in for surgery and removal of this lesion and any guesses by anybody It turned out to be histoplasmosis. Hmm. Really? Yeah. So wow. I don't think we were expecting histoplasmosis here in a six-year-old. Yeah, I'm, I mean, we see a lot of histo, but I've not seen nodes that big from acute histo. I mean, that's yeah, pretty calcified. Maybe. Yeah, and, and I mean, children can calcify fast, but okay. never seen residual nodes that big from histo. Yeah. So, so those were the three interesting cases uh, I had for you. Well, thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Three o'clock central time. So back to work. But thanks, everybody. And I think Howard is back next week. We'll continue. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.